Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Joy J. Moore. And I'm Michael Chan. And this is the podcast for a summer series on the book of Daniel, which is uh, originally here in 2024 to cover uh, five sessions on the book of Daniel from August 4th through September 1st, although people can always adjust that to fit themselves. And uh, this chan, uh, this, excuse me, this series was was written and de uh, designed by Michael Chan. I got ahead of myself. Michael is a former a colleague of ours at Luther Seminary, who's now the Vice President for Mission and Inclusion at Concordia College, Moorhead, Minnesota. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. It's great to be with both of you, of course, and to be talking about the book of Daniel even better. All right. All right so tell us about uh, just a brief overview of the series and uh, what they need, what folks need to know about that and why Daniel is a good uh, topic for this year. Daniel's is just, it's one of those books that I think doesn't often pop into people's minds as like, that's a really significant book from the from the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, but it really actually is. It informs a significant amount of, of I think, theology and text within the New Testament, especially as we think about, you know, what we sometimes call eschatological or apocalyptic texts, um, which are so formative in first century Judaism and, of course, within Christianity. But Daniel just doesn't often emerge or, you know, go to the top as being really important. I think it actually, I think it is, and I think it's quite influential. The series itself uh, doesn't cover the entire book, not all 12 chapters. It covers just a selection of texts from the two sections of Daniel. So people may remember Daniel can really be divided into two sections. The first is the uh, the court tales section, um, which is like Daniel 1 through 6. And then the second section is the apocalyptic section 7 through 12. And so all of them are tied together by the figure and character of Daniel. But from like a genre literary category perspective, they're vastly different. The text covered are, yeah, sorry, chapters 2, Part, mostly chapter two, chapter three, uh, six, chapter six, and then on the apocalypse side, seven and 12. I appreciate that, uh, Michael, and do appreciate uh, what you've provided us here. Um, just uh, a way of speaking of language, uh, we often think of apocalypse uh, as end times, and uh, it's want to think of it as uh, revelation through prophetic or symbolic visions. And uh, that, that, um, uh, that kind of helps in the fact that um, there's been 21 centuries since John's vision that we know as revelation and say 25 centuries since Daniel's revelation uh, that we have here in the sixth century before the common era. So uh, rather than seeing this as end times imminent, um, to um, invite your congregations to think of this as uh, visions that um, are reminders for the people of God to remain evidently faithful in the midst of a culture that is opposed to God. Um, these uh, would have been stories that Jesus and the disciples would have would have grown up hearing. Um, these had been passed down for generations uh, that tell of uh, this post-exilic uh, reality that uh, uh, invites God's people to keep confident of God's presence and peace in the midst of oppression and to maintain hope for God's future restoration. And I think um, if we keep that in mind as we're looking at these texts that are set in a time after Babylon's attack on Jerusalem. Um, we're in the midst of a post-exilic reality. Um, Israel is in chaos, um, both geographic, um, political, and economic. They're displaced. And so the narrative begins um, with these familiar stories that you've highlighted for us. And uh, reminding your listeners of that will... Um, uh, will greatly uh, enhance um, the humor, the hope, uh, and uh, the challenge of uh, this maybe, often yeah. overlooked book. Yeah, maybe I can just focus in on one word that you used, Joy, and that was kind of apocalypse and revelation. Uh, those those words are feel really loaded, you know, I think, or they feel obscure and just hard to put kind of grab onto. Uh, for the for the authors of Daniel, the world, this is a little bit simplistic, is though is is made up of things that one can see and also things that one cannot see. And uh, what one sees is not necessarily all that's going on. And so what the apocalypses do is they pull back the veil. 
and they say, what you're experiencing right now is sort of, uh, sort of you're experiencing empires and economic extraction and economic collapse. But behind that, there is this larger reality that you can't necessarily perceive, but somebody who's special uh, like Daniel with certain gifts is able both to see those realities and also to interpret and say why they matter in the present day. Exactly. Just a reminder, uh, uh, for those who want to read more about the book of Daniel, we obviously have uh, the commentaries on our website, as well as oh, there it introducing is. the Old yes. Testament. For those of you who are watching visually, uh, for those of you, most of you are listening, Michael and I co-wrote a book called Introducing the Old Testament, and uh, the chapter on Daniel was written by Michael. I'll just uh, mention that. All right, because Michael actually knows more about Daniel than is healthy for a person to know. True. All right. Week one is chapter two. A lot of long reading, uh, verses 24 through 49, and we call it the dream interpreted. So this is the story. Uh, a lot of these, uh, interesting thing, a lot, of, a lot of these stories in Daniel, especially the ones you've picked, are the, are, um, uh, there is something that has become a commonplace English phrase, you know. Um, for instance, here it's uh, clay feet or feet of clay that the vision of this uh, huge statue that is the head's gold, the chest silver, the legs iron, and then feet of clay. Uh, So, uh, Michael. Well, let me just say, chapter two is a very important story for understanding the book of Daniel, because I think it reflects the theological heart of the whole book. And in fact, I'm going to quote here just very briefly from verses 21 through 22, um, where Daniel describes God as one who changes times and seasons, deposes kings and sets up kings. Uh, He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. And so this is kind of, like I said, the theological heart of the book of Daniel that's true of the apocalyptic revelatory sections. And also here, this is also a revelatory chapter. Um, And so, yeah, this is a story about interpreting dreams. But part of the absurdity of the story is that Nebuchadnezzar's like, I don't want you to just interpret it. I want you to tell me what I dreamed. dreamed. (laughs) And, And if you know anything about sort of ancient divinatory practices, you know, this is so absurd. Um, I mean, people go in the ancient world, went through training to try to understand, like, how do you interpret the stars? How do you interpret a sheep's liver? Ask about that later. Um, but it, but it's true. They didn't l- learn how to divine what the person dreamed. It's a totally absurd story, but that nonetheless reflects these dynamics that Joy mentioned earlier about what is it like to live as a uh, uh, as an exiled people, uh, enslaved, I would say, in this case, because you have people who were conscripted into imperial service and service in the court. What does it mean to live in those dynamics where you have to uh, kind of function on multiple stages? Uh, of course, before living life before the king and the courtiers, and then life before uh, one's own people and, and one's own culture. So. Two is really important. There's uh, also the uh, parallel that you have at two and seven, um, where uh, the language is different. So the narratives that we have at the opening are in Hebrew, and then what we have uh, uh, in that next section becomes uh, Aramaic. And so that um, imagination of the story of God uh, that was passed down to Israel and a different imagination that you're in in ways describing um, uh, that would be true of Babylon is also evident in the fact that these same stories, different and yet the same, are presented in two different languages. Yeah, that and it's so easy to miss, right? If you're just reading it in English, though, Daniel is a thoroughly bilingual book. Yes. Um, and Aramaic and Hebrew really are, they're, they're different languages. They're certainly within the Semitic family tree, but they're, they're distinct languages. You can tell. Uh, the switch happens in 2 verse 4, I think. I can't quite remember. Um, where it's mid, literally mid-sentence, the author switches from Hebrew to Aramaic. And Aramaic really would have served at the time as a kind of lingua franca, sort of court language. Um, oh, Rolf is going to uh, bristle at that. But I'll, uh, but, but I'll give you an example from the book of Isaiah, when the, the Assyrian general walks up to the walls of Jerusalem and says, hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to kick your butt. Um, and the the Jerusalemite uh, envoys say, "Well, would you mind speaking in Aramaic?" <laughs> because they don't want all the people on the walls to hear. It's it's an edu- it's it's a language of the educated elite. 
uh, and of the court elite. Uh, but Rolf no, is going to push back. <laughs> I am not. Oh, you. I just have to laugh at this. So, by the way, so if, for those of you that uh, like to work with your Hebrew as you exegete the Old Testament, if you open up your Hebrew uh, Bible here or your Bible works or accordance, uh, you're not going to be able to read it unless you had Aramaic. Um, uh, although you'll be able to work with it a little bit. No, I here's what, what's funny is Aramaic was the lingua franca of the first century or something, right? I mean, so be, uh, mm. okay, Aramaic, lingua franca, which is Latin for French language. <laughs> so that's why it's, I, I just think it's so funny. So we're speaking in English, and it's just a hilarious sentence. Okay, what's the what's the preaching point uh, from your perspective, uh, Michael? I mean, uh, of this text. Yeah. So um, in all of these, in just about all of these situations, the th- Daniel and his three friends find themselves uh, stuck in some ways between fidelity toward their king, which they owe because he could kill them, <laughs> and fidelity and faithfulness toward their toward their God and their culture. And what we find with Daniel and his friends is that um, they are able to, what's the right word, uh, kind of um, cut the Gordian knot that they find themselves in in each story through trust and faithfulness in their God. Um, and and by leaning on the wisdom and, and grace that they have have received, and and so these are stories of di- like dilemmas uh, that kind of I think Jews of the time would have faced in vi- different kind of ways. Like, what do you do when you wake up the next day and the sacrifices you smell are to Marduk and not to Yahweh, or the language that you're hearing is Akkadian or Babylonian uh, and not Hebrew. And so how do you live in that kind of push and pull reality uh, uh, of being a people that is dominated and whose society has collapsed? You make a point in saying uh, in the commentary that uh, the theological insight is that it's uh, history is steered um, uh, not by the actions of rulers, armies, and politics, but rather by the God of Israel. And uh, I would um, encourage uh, uh, a point in the sermon thread to be that the recovery of this commitment to the God of Israel will be evident only if social, cultural, and political entities find these um, practices as peculiar or even offensive. The more we are just like everybody else, the more we have given up this peculiarity. And uh, um, the result of these three, uh, and, and I like to say four because we forget uh, it's uh, the three Hebrew boys plus Daniel, um, that Nebuchadnezzar turns his homage to Daniel's God but only for a while, because as king, uh, the pressure of those in his service and of the culture that he's over continually causes him to turn back, which we will read in the next chapter. Let's do that. Let's go to the next chapter. Um, The next chapter is probably the best, along with Daniel and the lion's den, it's probably the best known story from the book of Daniel, which is uh, of the giant golden statue and then the story of the fiery furnace um it's well known because both like when i was a kid there was a very popular musical uh set for churches to perform a cantata called um it's cool in the furnace that used a lot of jazz so it's cool in the furnace it was great it was fantastic and then of course uh what my kids were little veggie tales episode on this um one of the things that's so great about this story is if you get away, uh, I wrote a book recently with my brother on humor and preaching and humor in the Bible. And uh, I, we get a lot of pushback. There's no humor in the Bible. Well, actually, you, you have to get a cr- over your cultural. Um, so this is one of the places, especially if you stand and read this out loud with all the repetition of the ridiculous list. First of all, the size of the statue is uh, absurd. A statue Nick made Shadrach of gold. Looked like a, mo- a mosquito. There you go. Uh, it, I mean, so it's, you know, uh, a, a, a statue made of gold that's 60 cubits tall. So what is that, about 60 feet, roughly? It's like nine by tall. 90. It's like nine yeah. by 90. It's absurd. 90 feet tall, right? <laughs> and 
But then these lists, you know, um, the King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials. And then, of course, uh, and then it repeats it. So the satra, and so it, it's this absurd, uh, absurdist sort of parodying of royal power. And then the herald says, and I have a question for you about how you interpret the Aramaic here. Actually, this is back. Yes, this is still in Aramaic. The um, how you interpret one phrase, Michael. Whenever you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and then and it's usually translated the entire musical ensemble. But I wonder if it isn't actually any musical instrument. Kol, uh, zene, uh, and then. Zamar ah, and the ah at the end is the the for those. So it's anyway. Uh, thoughts on that? On the translational piece, yeah, that is, that is interesting because you're right. I mean, you're right that it's coal, right? So it could be it could be all or any, right? Any any uh, sound of an in, any sound of instruments. So or any sounds of instruments. I think it's plural. I th- I think that given the chapter's propensity to exaggerate, which is everywhere. I would wonder if it's the entire. Um, but again, like with, with Cole, you can't always know a certainty. Like there isn't an answer key on that, you know, but it's a good question. Yeah. Well, that's why I was, I was actually thinking the exaggeration then is anytime you hear any musical sound, you got to stop and worship this huge statue. So uh, either way, it's, a, it's this exaggeration. It's making fun but also noting the danger. So right. it's making fun of the emperor, but emperors, even stupid ones, even megalomaniacally stupid ones are really dangerous. They're the most creatures. dangerous in some ways. The most dangerous, powerful. Yeah, that I, I think you're right, Rolf, that the humor argument could go both ways on that translation, but you're right. Yeah, if you have like you, what the third chair clarinet decides to sound off because they're being an idiot, you still have to bow. Yeah, I was a clarinet player. <laughs> so yes, you, you would. You were a third clarinet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, if that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I um I play around with that. I love um uh, just naming uh the three Hebrew boys: Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. Um, yeah. <laughs> I can get away with that. <laughs> Depending on your congregation and community, wow. you might wow, not wow. want to use that one, but you can quote me right, right. if you've talked about me before. Um, but uh, just that recognition of um, um, uh, what it means to uh, be uh, these um, uh, Hebrew boys that are on ethnic scholarship to the finest of Babylonia's university. And they're, they've been brought in after uh, defeat so that they can be taught the cultural uh, practices. And um, uh, one of that is who to bow down to. And they refuse to bow down to anyone uh, but their creator God, uh, the God made known in Israel. And uh, so uh, Richard Hayes describes this in a sermon he preached, I can't believe it was 25 years ago, but it's relevant in that um, I don't care whose anthem is being played. I'm not going to bow down to anyone but the Creator God. And the power of this story is that they don't say, all right, um, we'll wait to see who's the most powerful. They say, even if our position and power and life is not preserved, we're going to tell you who is the God that needs to be feared. So, Joy, oh, you just kind of connected in sort of a joking way um, this story to the history of, of black slavery or a history of African-Americans in the United States. When I taught this class, Daniel, back at Luther, um, I often had students watch Lee Daniels, The Butler. Yes. Um, and the reason for that is because that's a story of a father and a son, Cecil, uh, f- played by the brilliant Forrest Whitaker, who's just one of my favorite actors on earth. Um it's about the story of a father and a son. The father works in the White House for presidents. He's a butler for presidents. And then the son is a, a 1960s civil rights activist in the Kingian tradition, right? And, and does all the protests and everything. And it's a story of a father and son intention around how you actually affect change um, in the world. And for uh, yeah, for, for Cecil the father, Cecil. it's about providing the absolute best example he can to these people who are in places of power. 
for his son, it was about changing the entire system. And so I think some of those dynamics also exist within the book of Daniel. Absolutely. The result of this story is a change in system. Because once again, the king is going to say, there is no other king, no other God than the God of Israel. And whenever our acts of disobedience um, result in anyone's positioning other than a naming of the God made known in Jesus, then we have failed to be that peculiar people that this story actually calls for. Yeah, I think what's interesting about these texts is that they are on the one hand, they are like both revolutionary and accommodationist. And like they're revolutionary in the sense that they're the hope is for a kind of cosmic revolution, right? God is the only one, the texts say, who deposes kings and changes times and seasons. Um, but in the moment before that happens, it's somewhat a, both accommodationist, accommodation and resistance. It's like a both yes. and kind of a thing. It's fascinating. Well, let's move on to week three, uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Um, I also want to go back to um, the historical setting of the narrative versus the historical writing down, and because I think it's a lesson for us today. So most Old Testament scholars, obviously the narratives take place uh, in the exilic, post-exilic time period, but they're probably written down, uh, what would you say, Michael, about roughly 150, 160 BC, uh, BCE? Yeah, in the second mid second century, I think that's probably right for a lot of them. Though, if if there are texts that are older than that, uh, they sure. exist probably in oral yeah. form, especially right. these narratives, right? And uh, who knows what their pre kind of collected status was, but yeah. The reason I bring it up is during this time period, uh, one fifty one sixty BCE, is uh, the Jews in the Holy Land are being uh, terribly persecuted by Seleucids. So telling stories from the past into the present, from the past about times of persecution into the present, and then for us to think about now how we're telling these stories again into, and how we're always telling the story of Jesus into our present. Um, So these great important stories of the past make sense of, we use them, God actually uses them to make sense of our lives. So what's the, what would you say the sort of key preaching or a key preaching point of the Daniel in the lion's den story is? Yeah, this is another, okay, so let me link this to Daniel 3 because both of these are stories of execution. These are both in some ways like death and return from death stories, right? I mean, in um, in the case of Daniel 3, death by furnace, but they're preserved in their entirety, you know, not even a hair singed um, by this, this divine, you know, kind of expression of God's presence that accompanies them in the flame. Um, similarly, Daniel is accompanied in the lion's den, in the pit, which, I mean, Rolf, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think like, Oftentimes, these holes and pits get used in the Psalms um, as kind of places that are more proximate to death than life on this earth. And so, um, because like for them, you know, death is a geographical place; like it's down there. You know, Jonah's descending down to the place of the dead. Um, and so, it's they, these are both kind of death resurrection stories or death return from life type stories. And I think we have to kind of read them in that way that the God of these texts is a God that rescues from from death. I would say that's one thing to take from it. There's humor in this one, uh, Ralph. Um, This is where uh, Daniel says, here, kitty, kitty. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think uh, your introduction, Ralph, is really important for us to recognize that we have hope for what God does in our present by rehearsing clearly what God has done in the past so we can recognize when God shows up. And so our faithfulness to the character of God, the faithfulness of God, and the peculiarity of the people of God who will go to this pit, who will enter into uh, this danger, um, trusting God to be faithful, because it's not about... um, our individual um, 
power, positioning, prosperity. It's always about a witness to the faithful character of God and the promise that has not yet been fully experienced. And when we lose sight of that, um, as you talked about uh, uh, earlier, um, that uh, the civil rights movement, um, what I experienced because of my grandparents' labor, my grandparents Mm. could only hope for. And too often, what we think now is that our work will result in everything happening right now. And Ralph, you're setting this up in the timing that you did as a reminder that the kingdom is not fully come, but we bear witness to glimpses of the faithful character of God so we can keep on even in a hostile moment. Yeah, thank you. Let's move on to um, Daniel 7. And this is where it really shifts. So that we shift from the court tale to now the apocalyptic uh, section. And um, a word about that, um, we Old Testament scholars like Michael and myself are, are taught that, first of all, apocalyptic is a genre. Uh, before, it's a theological category, um, which is what how New Testament people talk about it and theologians talk about it. But it, it, it's a genre in which characters have visions and uh, they don't understand the visions. And then usually there's an angelic interpreter Interpreter. uh, uh, who then unpacks and there's other features of it also, but I think uh, that's, that's enough for, for this. And so you're getting, first of all, the vision of the four beasts. And what I want to, first of all, emphasize is that, a lot of readers today try to figure out, oh, who are the four beasts today? And I think uh, reading this historically is to understand that the book of Daniel is describing uh, in its own world, uh, you know, what the, what these symbols mean. And then for us, it's to take that story about that time and put it into today. Uh, do you agree with that, Michael? I do. I, I think that's. I think that's fundamentally right, Rolf. I mean, if there one of the key insights that carries over from then to now is that empires are monstrous, right? Um, and that uh, and, and many human governments um, are, are monstrous in how and how they treat people and in the way that people literally get devoured by them. Um, and so that feels to me, I think, an interesting question. And I also get this from our, our former colleague Craig Kester. Is is to ask questions like, um, what are the monstrous forces that exist today in our world? Like, how would we, how would we label them? And we don't have to do that right now. But that's like the, the the question is like, what what is the beast that boasts and that devours and crushes and all of these different things? The uh, the devourers of this earth, I think, is how the Book of Revelation puts it. And they that is transhistorical. Those dynamics exist everywhere. And so we are the, what are we then called to do um, with the fact that we live among monsters, right? And uh, often monsters of our own making. Yes. Almost always and of our own making. <laughs> almost always of our own making. And uh, to just keep that theological um, uh, underscore, um, there's an echo of the stories uh, the narratives in um, the first six chapters that are happening to people, and now this uh, beginning at chapter seven, these visions, um, there's an echo of the creation um, invitation for the creator God to enter into chaos and to promise life. And humanity um, has the option of choosing to follow God's rule or to try and get it all um, now uh, by our own means and developing our own systems that are counter uh, God's promise and God's timeline. And and that's another way of reading it, whereas you've identified, Ralph, it, it doesn't mean for us to try and decipher who and what it is for today, but to have the imagination that there is um, there are the creatures uh, of the earth and creatures of the sea. Monsters is the word I'm looking for. There are monsters on the earth and monsters of the sea um, that um, represent what tempts us to not trust God and to try to create systems and institutions that will get us what God alone has promised. 
And in fact, the church learns, and we need to learn this the hard way, that when, even when God's people are put in charge of the empire, because we continue to be under the power of sin, it, and it operates dominion within our individual and our corporate bodies, our Christian um, empires have been equally as horrible as uh, like a communist empire or other empires throughout throughout uh, the world. And so the answer is not a, um, got to be careful because this might sound political today, but the answer is not a new Christian or Jewish empire. The answer is that God will sustain God's people even in the midst of imperial um, power. Let's let's uh, let's move uh, since we're already at thirty-two minutes here. Let's move and wind down with week five, the end of the story, uh, the story of the end of days. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, in the in the commentary, I mentioned that this you really need to start at chapter ten. Ten through twelve is probably the, one of the hardest okay. sections of Daniel to interpret. It's it's you really need honestly, you really need a commentary alongside it, I think, if you want to understand it in any detail. And like the one that I wrote is not enough detail if you really want to go deep into it. Like it'll provide you, Rolf and my book will provide you as kind of overview, but it's helpful to go line by line. Um, the text we focus on are chapters tw- is chapter 12. And this is where you really get the, what I would say is kind of the earliest reference to what what is a recognizably kind of Christian way of thinking about sort of the resurrection in the afterlife where you have the uh, uh, people raised, the dead raised, and then sorted, as it were, um, uh, the the righteous and and the unrighteous, quote unquote. And uh, you really get this clearly articulated in Daniel 12. But the larger historical context matters here, I think, a lot. the, The historical sections in 10 and 11 really culminate with the persecution of a, of really bad dude named Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And he, he really goes about persecuting um, religious Jews, especially in and around Jerusalem, preventing them from uh, exercising their religious rights, etc. And the theology of resurrection that emerges here really is a kind of theology of resistance against that particular kind of tyranny. So sometimes when we think about resurrection, we think about it as some kind of weird, like abstract, dis you know, just a disconnected doctrine. But I think it probably arose as a kind of political resistance literature. And so you get a political resistance theology, and maybe that's part of why when Paul turns to his long treatise on resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, it is a fighting document. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Um, and, and so Paul takes it up as a combative doctrine, not one that just kind of exists in abstract disconnection from human life. That's what 12 is about, I think. I find it interesting also, uh, just tying it back to the earlier uh, chapters, is that what you have with the um, the narratives at the v- very beginning is not uh, the desire for power and positioning, but the desire to bear witness to God. And it is God who places them in power. And they are ruling in a non-Jewish culture. And they are ruling under God's rules. And that is what becomes uh, so countercultural. They don't take on, now we have position and power so we can do to them what they would do to us. Instead, they rule out of righteousness. And what would that look like in today's context where we have such diversity that people uh, in leadership would actually be able to say, I'm going to rule in such a way that every human created in the image of God thrives. Well, thank you. And thank you, listeners, uh, for listening all the way to the end of this, because after all, it says in 1212, happy are those who persevere. So Thank you. Uh, you (laughs) Reminder that the commentary is on the website and blessings to you as you preach.